is that those of us who've been here for a long time, we really do need each other as friends. And we really do cling to each other as friends. And the cross that is right behind me is the thing that we rally around. It's the thing that makes us all one family. And it's that cross that you see hanging on the back of the church, in the front of the church. Uh, this particular cross not being covered with blood, but being symbolic of what we stand for as Christians. Uh, there's some religions who stand for blood, and the blood for them, in order for them to make blood pour forward and pour forth, they commit atrocities and murder and butcher innocent human beings. Now, that's not the kind of religion that we have as Christians. We do not shed other people's blood needlessly. And the reason we don't is because the people that have a religion that manifest itself in violence and ignorance comes from a leader who never shed his blood for his people who are partakers of his religion. Our religion is a lot different. Our religious leader who we claim to be our Savior and our Lord, who we claim to be the ruler of the entire universe, did not require of his sheep and his people to take other people's life and shed blood. But he shed his own blood for his people. That, that is a, a staggering difference in concepts. Jesus never asked us to go shed the blood of other people, but he himself personally shed his own blood because he loved his people. And that's what they sing about today. That's what basically Donald was singing about today. The fact that we have a symbolic figure of our faith and that symbolic figure is a cross which hangs behind it. And it's my prayer that we can live up to our Savior and what He's done for us. This morning we're going to look in the book of John at the fifth chapter beginning with the 17th verse. And we're going to stay in John all morning. And we're going to look at how Jesus looked at His Father. We're going to look at the relationship that God the Father had with God the Son. And as we look at that relationship, I would like for each one of us to examine our relationship with those two entities. Matter of fact, three. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But in particular, our relationship with the Son. Because I know that all three persons were involved in our salvation. But to me personally, the Son is the one who shed His blood and suffered and died for us 
So I believe because of that, that we should have a particularly close relationship with the Son. So we're going to talk about that this morning. John, the fifth chapter, beginning with verse 17. Five seventeen. Therefore the Jews, but Jesus answered them, and said, My father worked to the two, and I work. Uh, Jesus begins in this first sentence by talking about what the sermon will be about today. Uh, you, you might say in a colloquial terminology, where did Jesus get his marching orders? You might say, where did Jesus get his job description? And, and how did Jesus know what his goal was when he came to the world? It wasn't the New Testament because there was no New Testament then. It wasn't from religious leaders of a day because they were sometimes going in the opposite directions than Jesus. So how did he know what to do? How did he know from moment to moment how to react? One way that he knew is because he was fully God and yet he was fully man. And retaining his Godhood is a little mysterious and we don't know exactly all the details. But there is a possibility that he could have taken uh, the leadership from himself still being God as he was directed through his life. But there are striking instances that we will read this morning which tell us that there was also another source from which Jesus took his orders and whereby he was guided through his life. You know, I didn't really see this for a long time growing up, the later in life. I, I never really examined the relationship between the Father and the Son in depth till I begin to read some good theology. And then I was a little taken back when I discovered what I'm about to tell you. I kind of thought many years ago that Jesus just came to the world. He did what he was supposed to do of his own volition. He died, he rose, and he went back to heaven. Especially since it says in the Bible that God gave him after his passion and resurrection all authority. Especially over the church. But one day I was reading and I began to read that Jesus seemed to be totally subservient to the Father. And I was a little bit, a little shocked because I never really looked at the relationship like that until it came to me many years ago. And it shows us, who are Christians, that we also should be not only subservient to the Father, but subservient to the Son. We've got so many people in churches today who have been led possibly too quickly by a preacher or a soul winner into believing they were saved before the Holy Spirit actually saved them that they aren't subservient to either one. They're still subservient to themselves and to Satan 
because unfortunately many people have not had a genuine experience with the Lord to be really saved. If a person is saved, that person will have a, a change of nature. The Holy Spirit will come into you and He will regenerate you and make you alive spiritually and He will actually change your very nature. The people that have had salvation experiences all over the world, if their experience did not include this important fact, they cannot be sure that they're saved. In my book I'm writing, I put a little chapter this weekend into it about that very thing, the nature being changed in order to become a Christian. And you know, the Bible refers to lost people as goats. And the Bible refers to saved people as sheep. Well, I put this little humorous sentence in there. And I was talking about the fact that until God changes a sinner's nature, he is not a Christian and he is not saved. Because he still totally has the sinful nature. Totally. So I wrote this sentence. It goes something like this. A goat, if he thinks that he's become a sheep, and he's not really a sheep, but he is still a goat, he will continue to eat cans. Now that's way out there. It's got nothing to do with the seriousness of the sermon. But I wanted to make a point that would get people's attention. And that's true. Now, it's a symbolic example of what happens to people who think they're saved. Somebody told them they were saved, but they're really not saved. They will still continue to eat cans and a lot of other bad things. <laughs> their, their nature won't change. Amen. So, now that I've got your attention, um, we'll continue. What did Jesus say here? The Jews were there with him and, 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 and they were uh, criticizing him for, for healing a man on the Sabbath. And, and then in verse 19, Jesus says to them, Very, very, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth the Father, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth himself all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. You know, Jesus says this over and over and over again, particularly in the book of John. He continues to say, I, I can do nothing without the Father. Everything that I do is what the Father wants me to do. And he continues to say it over and over and over to make the point that even he, part of the Godhead, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of the living God, is not free to do just whatever He wants to do. And that is, my friends, one of the biggest things that, that keeps people from being saved is that they want to do what they've always done, they enjoy their sin, and they're not about to give up their sin and control themselves to someone else. They're not about to let God be Lord and ruler of their life. 
I had a lady tell me a couple of years ago, we talked about going to church. She said, I, I'm not going to any church. I said, why? She said, well, most churches, and in particular your church, have a man standing in the pulpit preaching. And I said, duh. You're right. You, you made an accurate statement. But her next statement I had not, I had no answer to. And she said, furthermore, that man or no other man is going to tell me what to do. And I quickly assured her I wasn't a man, but I was just a preacher. But I don't know if she believed me. But when a man enters the pulpit, you, you kind of have to separate him from a man doing everyday things. And if he's in the pulpit representing God and the Holy Spirit is working through him and using him, you look at him or should look at him if he is doing what he should be doing as a servant of God making a proclamation of the, of the, of the, of the gospel. Amen. So you have to look beyond the man. The man is not important. You have to look at the message that is being preached. Amen. And so, where do we get our messages? We get them from God Himself, from the Holy Spirit, and from the Word of God. Amen. The man has no authority, but the Word of God has all authority. Amen. And that is what people should hear. That's right. Amen. But Jesus says in 21, For the Father raises up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. A very important statement. If you compare that statement with the statement in Ephesians, the second chapter, in verses 8 through 10, the same thought is given in Ephesians. The same Greek words are used in Ephesians uh, that are used here. And, and the same picture is being drawn and even the same words are being used. The key word here is the word quickening. The Father raises up the dead and quickeneth them. Even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. And not only does Jesus use the word quicken here, but in the same verse, he gives the meaning of the word quicken. He said, the Father quickens and he raises up the dead. It's the same meaning. It's also the same meaning as the word regeneration. They all three mean the same. And, and by the way, so does the phrase born again. All four of these phrases mean the exact thing, same thing. They mean that only God can quicken a person, can raise a spiritually dead person to have spiritual life, can see and activate and implement in a sinner the ability to be born again. And Jesus says, the son quickeneth whom he will. You remember Nicodemus? Nicodemus came to Jesus and Jesus told him he must be born again. And he said, Nicodemus, the, the, the wind bloweth where it listeth and you don't know not where the wind blows. He was really talking about the Holy Spirit. He said the Holy Spirit moves upon this earth and goes to the places that the Father sends the Holy Spirit and He quickens and regenerates whom He will. And that's a, a beautiful thought. That's a, a big part of the Gospel. If Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, the very Son of God, who God said, I'm giving you all authority, 
has to be subservient to the Father, would you not think that the Holy Spirit also has to be subservient to the Father? And the beautiful thing is, is this. We're not saying that God's up here dictating and God's a big big boss and, 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 and there's an unequal trinity. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible teaches that all persons of the Trinity, all three of them, work in complete unison. And everything one of them does, the other is doing as well. Amen. There's no separation, there's no confusion in the Trinity. And so it should be in the church. Whatever the Lord Jesus is leading us to do, we should all be on the same page and there should be unity. And that's how you have a church that will be successful in God's sight. And praise God, we have that here. We may not have much, but we have that. And we have also much to be thankful for. But he quickens him if he will. You know, as, as Jesus told Nicodemus, God goes to the earth seeking out sinners. And when he finds sinners, he alone imparts spiritual life to them. A man cannot impart spiritual life to himself. I said this yesterday on page 1,234 of my book I'm writing. I guess you really believe that. But I did say it in, in, the, in the manuscript. I said this along with other things. I said, a man cannot of himself without the Holy Spirit cause himself to be saved. A man without the help of the Holy Spirit is not going to attempt to be saved because he's dead in sin and has no spiritual life. In that same vein, a, a sinner, man or woman, cannot quicken himself. A man by himself who is a sinner, who is dead spiritually, with no spiritual life, cannot regenerate himself or does not have the authority of the spiritual power to cause regeneration to take place in himself. There's certain things men can't do. They can't fly without the help of a machine or an airplane or a glider. They can't submerge themselves underwater and swim from here to the east. And they can't save themselves. Salvation of necessity has to be completely of God. No. Completely of God. Because number one, God is the only one who has the authority to save the godly. God is the only one who has the power to save. And 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 coming forth from the Godhead. As he came to earth and took upon human flesh, a member of the Godhead has to come, be perfectly righteous with no sin, and die for sinners, and be raised from the dead, because only that person has the authority to regenerate a lost sinner. And, and beloved, there's only one such person. 
There's not three saviors or four saviors or a hundred saviors and, and the ridiculous statement that so many people in our secular culture makes that all gods are the same, it doesn't really matter. Just believe on somebody or something is the most ludicrous statement that's ever been made. Amen. You can't just believe on anybody. Anybody did not go to the cross and die for our sins. Not even other religions. I have never studied another religion, and I may have missed it somewhere, but I have never studied another religion which said that their God came into this world, became a human, fully God and fully man, and lived in our body like unto us a perfect sinless life and that God died having God pour out his anger and wrath upon him instead of the ones that he intends to save. I don't know of any other religion that even teaches that. So how, and I had people tell me this in the last two months, it's kind of, it's kind of like one of my pet peeves that just really it just hurts me, you know. I said, well, we can go to any church of any faith in any country, and God's the same. Beloved, that is an unbiblical, unscriptural statement. And that's a statement which is dangling out in a void of unreality. It is not true. Jesus said from his own mouth, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no man, no man cometh to the Father but through me. So whose God are you going to believe? Are you going to believe Jesus who sheds blood for his own people? Are you going to believe the God that takes the blood of others in the name of his prophet? That's why Jesus has that close relationship with the Father because he and the Father are one. Amen. And he and the Father are the ones who prepared the plan of salvation and they implemented the plan of salvation. And why did he do it? You know, the most amazing thing of all, if God had never created anyone, he would not have, have placed himself in the position of having to send his son to die for anyone. God knew all that. He knew what was going to happen. He sees everything. He knows everything. He's omniscient. But knowing that his son would one day have to come and suffer and bleed and die, he still went into creature acts and created man. Amen. Because, you know why? And you know why Jesus came and died? It, it wasn't really just to be doing something. The fact that urged and motivated Jesus to come and suffer a horrible death on the cross was because he loved his church and his people. Amen. It was for us, beloved. That's why he did that. It was for us. Amen. Because he loved us. As this God comes and the Holy Spirit moves upon this world and 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 and, and seeks out those that are to be saved and he saves them. Here's what Jesus says about that. 
John 6, 37. And all the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I would no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do